Hey fellow dividend and value investors, welcome back to another video on this channel. This time I would like to discuss Fresenius with you, a company in the medical care space. And this stock has just released their latest earnings this week, so it's a good time to assess their business and assess whether it's a good time to buy it right now. But don't worry if you're not familiar with Fresenius, I'll introduce you briefly to this very popular European dividend aristocrat to you at the beginning of this video. So have your coffee or tea ready and let's get started. As most of you know, there are six main criteria that I look for when analyzing a business and a stock. The first one is, does it have a catalyst and a mode, which means can it grow in the upcoming years and can it be protected from its competitors? The second one is, is there you know, consistent earnings growth over time? The third one is, how does the cash flow look like? Because in the end, cash flow is king and this is what I really look for in a company. The fourth one, does it have a healthy balance sheet? You know, a healthy balance sheet gives lots of options to do acquisitions and other shareholder returns. The fifth one is the dividend safety, because that's one of the reasons why we invest as dividend investors and dividend growth investors especially. And the last one, what about their valuation? I just don't want to overpay for a company or, or stock in my portfolio. So having said that, let's look into Fresenius. So Fresenius is actually quite diversified business and it consists of four business units. The first one is for seniors medical care, which is the leader in treating people with chronic kidney failure. And it is specifically big in the United States. For seniors, Helios is um, what you might know specifically when you're living in Germany from the, the hospital systems the, because it's a private hospital operator. And then we have for seniors, Kabi, which I find a really interesting business, which provide essential drugs, nutrition products, but is also lately entering into the biosimilars market. And this is something I really find interesting. Last but not least for seniors, Famet is a kind of a service provider helping to build and design new healthcare facilities like clinics and hospitals. Now probably good to mention before we go further, you can get for seniors with the ticker ETR, FRE, this is the Google ticker, if you want to look it up, or ISIN, as you can see here on the page. This will allow you to look up the, the ticker or the company in your broker if you want to if you want to buy the stock later on at the end of this video. This company has been founded in 1912 by the Fresenius family, um, but really it built up in 1946 after the World War when the daughter of Fresenius uh, started to build this out into a pharmacy business. It's currently located in Bad Homburg uh, von der Höhe in Germany. It yields 2.22% with a price to earnings of about 12.8%. So if we look at uh, Fresenius business units, then you can see that Fresenius medical care is by far the biggest income provider from a sales point of view to the business with 17.8 billion. This is about 50% of the total company. Fresenius Helios, the hospital uh, operator with almost 10 billion. Fresenius Kabi with 7 billion and Vamet with around 2 billion. Nicely diversified, I would say, even if you take into consideration Fresenius Medical Care, because Fresenius Medical Care is actually a company listed by itself and by its own as well. It um, has around 4,000 clinics and it treats 350,000 approximately patients. As you can see, the North America, so America and Canada, the income and the contribution to their revenue is around 3 billion, which is the majority of their revenue. And think about here again about all the dialysis that it does and such when it comes to kidney diseases. If we look at Fresenius Helios, they have around 90 clinics in Germany and 53 cl clinics and 70 outpatient centers in Spain. And then Vamet uh, has already done around 960 projects in about 100 countries. I like this kind of business model from Vamet because as you can see, Fresenius has a lot of knowledge on this on this space about building clinics and hospitals so why not use this knowledge to help other companies out as well i really like this kind of service businesses and you know probably this is what we should really call optionality when we look at the business model Last but not least is for seniors Kabi. And what I love just here is that they entered into the biosimilar uh, market because this is really a market of opportunities in my, in my opinion, specifically for a company like for seniors. And what I like is when I look at their pipeline actually, is that they have already got uh, acceptance for a review of the regulatory submission uh, for their Peckfield grass team biosimilar candidate. But actually, they got already approval for something called Idacio. That's their first biosimilar that they have got Marcus access for in Europe, and it's competing with Yumira. And Yumira, if you know, is the top-selling drug in the world. And by whom? 
by Upfi. So I've got already a full position in Upfi. And if I would ever own Fresenius, I would still benefit probably from the biosimilar if it's taking off the Yumira revenue from Upfi. Some of that might go to Fresenius and give the growth to Fresenius in that case. Um, special milestone here to look for, forward for is 2023 when they hope to get acceptance in the US to start launching this biosimilar. So keep a look uh, on this one. It might be really interesting. If it uh, gets that far, they expect triple digit euro million in sales. So having said that, there are two growth drivers that I see for this company. It's further entry into new markets like the biosimilars, like I just mentioned with uh, Fresenius Kabi. And at the same time, also the growing need for care. I think people are still getting older in Europe, specifically also in Germany and Spain. In Germany, many people are wealthy, so they have money for, for special care if they need to. So I believe the just the increasing clinics and such should be good for the business. And if we think about Fresenius Medical Care, I do believe that after the pandemic, um, we should see an uptick again in further treatment of, of kidney diseases, specifically in America, but also in the other continents on the globe. But this is not all about Fresenius business for me, because there's something really important to know here if we look at the shareholder structure. Because if we look at this, what you will notice here is that Elze Kroner Fresenius is having a 27% stake in this company. So Elze Kroner Fresenius Stiftung is, the, is effectively the corporation or the NGO that has been created after the de death, death of Elze Kroner. And she was the founder, effectively, as how we know Fresenius today. She took over the company from her father in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the late 40s after the Second World War. And she built up this whole business of Fresenius and Fresenius Medical Care. So what she has done, her inheritance after her death has been given to an NGO and this NGO does grants and, and how is it research that serve the public and interest and everything they do should also be publicly shared. But what is interesting here for dividend investors, if you look at their website and what you see here in the footnotes, as a major shareholder of the healthcare group Free Seniors, the foundation's income consists in dividends from these shares. So this reminds me Hershey. If you think about the chocolate uh, business in America, they have something similar. The Hershey uh, Corporation or the NGO that's on top of that, that has a major um, holding into, into the company of Hershey is also living off the dividends. And for me, this is perfect because what you hear, have here is a strong alignment between the main shareholder of the company and me as a dividend growth investor because such um, a corporation, NGO, also requires increasing income to, to fund the, how you say it, the cost of their research. So both the major sh majority shareholder and myself, if I would be an owner for seniors because I don't hold the shares yet, would be beneficiary and having the same incentive of dividend growth. So I really, really love this because this is something that serves us both really well. One more last thing about for seniors, what's good to know, the company has also announced already some time ago uh, quite a cost-cutting program and you see it is cr across all their business lines so i think this is in generally good as long as it uh, in allows them to increase the operating margin so they see savings here i think they had some fat on the bone so management is actively trying to decrease their cost while they are also working on increasing their uh, uh, sales it's always important to know to understand a little bit what's going on in the corporate culture and on their background there Okay, so let's then look into Fresenius from a financial performance point of view. How is the business actually running? Because in my opinion, uh, maybe good to summarize, it's a high quality business. I really like the diversification, the markets they operate in, also the healthcare business and the healthcare industry with the growing need for healthcare is really an interesting um, uh, play for myself as a dividend growth investor. So if you look then from financial performance, the price went really nowhere. Effectively, when you look at the top here around April 2017 till now, the price has declined by about 45, 46%. This is huge. So if you owned here the stock probably at a 1% yield or a 0.8% yield, and you are in it for the capital gains, you won't be happy, really not. And there are different reasons for it. They tried to acquire the biosimilars business from Merck. It failed, so they did a termination agreement. Then also they had like 
downgraded their forecast and what you, what you can see here as well it went almost from 70 euro all the way to 40 euro in literally two three months so this was also like a big drop in 2018 so i guess it washed out many investors and then at the break at the start of the outbreak of covid 19 pandemic we also saw a big drop again all the way to 25 euro but since then it has picked up again uh, and it's now trading around 30 39 euro so what are then the targets of the company itself? So they are guiding for organic sales growth of 4 to 7 percent between 2020 and 2023 and an organic net income growth from 5 to 9 percent. We always need to look uh, at the footnotes here because they say net income attributable to shareholders of Fresenius before special items. I hate the special items, but let's look at what the reality brings us. Because what we can see here in the 10 year performance, the company doubled, more than doubled their revenue, which is really great. But what I don't like here at Fresenius, and this is where it comes like a good business doesn't necessarily make always a good stock. Their gross margin has declined from 34%, so the, the low 30s, to the high 20s, 27, 28%. This is something that I'm not too happy with because it means that their costs are growing farther, f uh, faster effectively than the revenue is growing. At the same time, we see it also here in the operating margin from a net income point of view, from a 15.5% uh, to 10.9%. Um, net income has grown really meagerly from 1.3 billion to 1.8 billion, let's say, and look at uh, that when you compare it to the revenue, more than twice double. We don't see that back in the net income. So definitely there is something to fix here in the company when it comes to the financial performance. It's not such a good uh, view what we see here. However, from earnings per share point of view, it went from 1.4 euro till 3 euro now. So at least it doubled here. Not too bad, but I would like to see stronger, more in line with revenue. And actually, usually you expect when revenue is growing, let's say with 10%, usually I expect earnings to then to grow with 15% because there should be more, how you say it, uh, fixed cost and therefore variable cost, which makes, it, which makes it easier for a company usually when they have uh, um, proper fixed cost management to have a better earnings per share growth than sales growth. From free cash flow growth, it has been also a mixed bag. You see that it has been like going from uh, from around one and a half billion in 2012, slow decline, then up, then um, of course down again because of a uh, big acquisition that they wanted to do with Merck. And then you see again a windfall by um, uh, some additional cash flow coming in again as a one-off. So all in all, they don't have, um, I would say it's stable free cash flow, but I would say all in all probably around 1.8 billion if we look at these numbers uh, over the last five years. Having said that from balance sheet point of view, we see that most equity equals their debt. Usually I like to see a debt to equity ratio of under 60%. We need to know that this is a business that's heavy capital intensive because of all the um, uh, assets that they have and they operate so it's not not too bad but they also have an uh, how you say it a debt rating of bbb uh, when we think about s p so i think this is not the best balance sheet that is out there um, i hope that they will focus a little bit more on further increasing shareholders equity or at least decreasing some of their long-term debt going forward because the trend is different as you can see the trend has been an increasing long-term debt in the last few years if we also briefly look into the last uh, quarterly three earnings, they say that for seniors medical care has been impacted stronger than projected by COVID-19. It's really simple. If you need people, if you have people with a kidney disease and they can't go to the hospital or they die because of their weak health situation, it's not allowing uh, for seniors to treat those people. In this case, uh, what the company here really says is that their Q3 earnings have been impacted severely by the excess patient mortality at Fresenius Medical Care. So this is something to, to know about. Uh, if COVID would end, it would do the company really well. Until then, we will see that uh, I think the earnings will still be a little bit impacted by this. Other than that, the business overall doing good. So cost uh, and savings program is running. So nothing that's uh, sp special here. No sudden, uh, uh, how you say it, downward guidance that suddenly lets the stock drop with 20%. So all in all, Pretty, pretty decent earnings, I would say. So from a financial uh, performance point of view, I don't like too much what I'm seeing over the last five years. So I think we really need to think about how it is going to look going forward. I think the business has performed mediocre to underperforming. 
I would have uh, I would have liked to seen better numbers specifically in when knowing that they're in the healthcare space. So what about the shareholders returns then? How has it uh, been doing like that? Has it at least been treating the shareholders fair, very well? So let's have a look into that. Well, this is really where the story starts because Fresenius is a real dividend aristocrat from a European point of view. 28 years of non-stop dividend growth. Not even like keeping the dividend the same in a single year, continuous growth. This is what I love. It's really unique. I can't tell you many companies that have such a dividend growth track record. And it is since they became public. So there was no year with a dividend cut and it survived um, both the dot-com uh, bubble, both the great financial crisis in 2007, 2008 and the latest pandemic. The forward uh, free cash flow payout ratio and earnings payout ratio stands around 30%, which is uh, around their, let's say, 10-year average. You see there's a little uptick, and that has to do with the uh, decrease or the stability in earnings growth. And their five-year uh, growth in five-year average growth in dividend has been around 11%. Was good to know in the last two years it was around 5 and 6%. But if you think about it from a chowder rule, remember the dividend yield here is 2.23%. It would uh, make the threshold now of more than 12% in chowder. If we then look at uh, if there was any buybacks, no, you can see here there was actually an increase in share count and we still see that today because every year there are a few, few thousands of shares um, uh, added to the shares outstanding because the company is doing some option plans for their employees and it is not having any buyback uh, plan. So in that, uh, from that point of view, uh, the company is not doing a lot here. I understand they don't have the strongest balance sheet, so I just hope that they will not dilute too much going forward. And we can see that at least since 2017, there has been no share dilution anymore. So let's cross fingers that it will stay like this. So as a dividend investor, I'm really happy with this company from that point of view. 30% payout ratio, dividend yield of 2.23 and 28 years of non-stop dividend growth. Excellent in my opinion. So we know now, good business, mediocre financial performance, good shareholder returns. So let's look into some of the risks. I see actually four main risks here. If there is a continuation of COVID-19 outbreaks, I believe that the company will be still facing some headwinds, specifically coming from Fresenius Medical Care. Of course, political also when we think about the kidney uh, treatment in America, where 3 billion of their business comes from. Pressure on pricing and reimbursement due to political changes and political policies might be impacting the business severely. Um, product issues like we have last, lately seen with Philips as an example. We don't want that here for a healthcare company that has also um, these kinds of assets. So let's um, hope that this will not happen anytime going forward. And last but not least, if they fail to execute in their pipeline with the biosimilars, that can be really costly because 75% of their R&D is currently being expensed by the R&D for the biosimilars. And I can tell you, creating a generic is easy, but creating a biosimilar is really, really hard. And it's also from a, a FDA approval point of view. So these are the four main risks. It's good to know about this. And actually some of these risks, like the continuation of COVID-19, might keep a cap on their earnings growth going forward in the upcoming months to years. So now that we know this, let's have a look into their valuation. Is it also a good stock to own from a value point of view? So I would like to remind you here, the stock has been going nowhere. We saw that already earlier at the share price. Usually at this stage, it's the first time that I look at the share price. So it's heavily down, not at the bottom. I don't expect the bottom to come anytime soon like uh, we saw last year in the pandemic because the world has it more under control now. But if we look at it here, dividend yield 2.22%, EPS payout 29. I don't look at the free cash flow payout here. It was too high because of the uh, one-offs in the cash flow. A PE of 12 and a revenue growth of around 5%. As you can see here, the EPS growth is really not good. I need to see this more going forward. And the return on invested capital, uh, more being than the cost of capital, of just 1%. The company is not doing really well from that point of view. They need to get higher return on capital. The return on equity looks much better. From that point of view, it would be like a 3%. So at least to us as equity holders, 
um, the company is doing a little bit better but um, this is something where I at least need to see two percent because that means that uh, the company is just creating value and it's creating little value at the moment in the last two years when it comes towards the shareholders as I mentioned before no share reductions rather a 1.8 improvement or increase and dilution in share count and this is not something I'm happy with as a shareholder I want to see it the other way so these are the overall statistics, but as you know, I really am in favor of a discounted cash flow um, analysis because that really tells me what the business is worth paying for right now. So let's have a look into that. Uh, what you can see here is that I'm using a free cash flow of 1.8 billion. This is more in line at the moment with their earnings of 1.8 billion. So if you think about it like that, the market cap currently is 22 billion. And if I use, in the baseline case, a growth rate of 4%, which is slightly below the company's own guidance, I think the company is still a bit too optimistic here based on their past performance, and a growth rate of 2%, then I think that that's really more realistic for the company right now. That's also because of the performance here, I really want to see a, a return on investment for myself of 10%. I give the company a terminal multiple of 11, slightly high, higher than what is trading right now. Again, I think the company has not been convincing me over the last five years that it's doing the right things for shareholders. It has been growing meagerly, and that's what I want to reflect in the baseline case as well. Let's assume that they do turn it around a little bit and get some more tailwinds. Then I assume that they could grow with 7% in the next five years and 4% in the years after. But if the case is really bearish, then I believe that the growth rate will be maybe 1% and no growth afterwards. And it deserves then a terminal multiple of 9%. Well, you could see it already on the screen probably the fair value per share here therefore for me is 42 euro 43 euro let's say which is uh, above the current price for what is trading right now on top of my 10 percent discount rate i would like to see a 20 percent margin of safety just in case i'm wrong here and the company keeps performing mediocre therefore my buy price is in the light, low 30s let's say around 34 35 euros so having said that, this is how I value the company now. It's, I think, a really high quality business. They just need to do better on their financial performance. If they are able to return to a proper financial performance as they have been doing most of their history, then I believe that this company can quickly trade much more higher. But hey, it's not giving me any evidence that, that it will be doing that in the upcoming, let's say, two, three years. Hence, what I will do with this company, as always, I will start selling put option at 35 euro. If it uh, gets executed, I'm happy as a happy owner at that moment in time. And if it doesn't get executed, at least I collect some premiums, which I consider a personal dividend for me. So to recap this whole video, Catalyst and Moat, pretty okay. Earnings growth, uh -uh, not too happy with it. Uh, strong free cash flow, I'm really unhappy with it. I want to see more stability and more growth. Doesn't have the most healthiest balance sheet, but still good enough. Dividend safety, excellent, 30% uh, payout ratio and a 28 years dividend growth, plus the major investor of this uh, NGO having the same incentives, incentive as I have. I love it. And from a valuation point of view, I am actually happy with the valuation. I just want to see a stronger discount. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and to like. Um, definitely leave some of your comments. If you disagree with me as well, it makes me a better investor. And if you agree with me, a shout out just puts a smile on my face. Having said that, have a great day and speak to you next Sunday again.